and the prototype is where you make effectively a model of your website. Um, it doesn't need to be complete. All right, there can still be some things that you're working on, but it should be good enough that if you gave it to someone, they'd be able to look at it and give you some good feedback, whether they like it, they don't like it, what needs to be changed, and so on. So our task over the next few days is going to be to take the wireframe and to make a prototype from it. And then really from there, from the prototype, really all you need to do is then finish it up by making sure you have corrected all the little problems and getting your contact, content right and, and so on. Um, a couple things to keep in mind about the wireframe as you're building the prototype. All right, let, let's, let's talk about that. And let's start with a real, real, real simple uh, wireframe. Wireframe that looks like this. And a lot of sites, especially simpler sites, are going to this sort of layout for one reason is because it's a layout that, that scales down to a mobile device nicely. Um, multiple column sites don't really work real well on, on a mobile device simply because the screen is too small. Uh, we will talk uh, at some point next week about uh, a little bit about some of the things that you can do to make your site work both on a desktop and on a mobile device. But for now we're going to keep it simple and so our first pass is going to be uh, a prototype uh, that, that looks like this, uh, that looks at like, like this sort of wireframe. Now here's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, certain sections of this are going to be common on every page that we do. So for example, the header. I'll sort of shade that in. The nav and the footer will more than likely be identical on every single page. Right? One of the principles of good design is consistency and consistency between pages on your site. So you don't have the navigation look different on one page versus another. If your navigation looks a certain way, it looks a certain way. All right? It's in the same position on every page. And therefore consistency is important and we would want these, these elements to look the same from page to page to page. All right? Now, with what we know about HTML and with what we've covered so far, what that means is we're going to develop a template. In other words, we're going to develop a page that has this stuff on it, and then we're going to clone that template for the specific pages. So we'll make copies of this page. Now, after we've made copies of this page, if we decide we want something different in the header, then we're going to have to go back and make that change in four places. Assuming we have four pages or ten pages, uh, ten times if we have ten pages or whatever. So we're going to make sure that the stuff that's common on, pay, on each page the HTML code that's common on every page, we're going to make sure, we're going to do our best to get that right. All right? Because we don't want to have to go and redo it multiple times once we've started cloning the pages. All right? So we're going to pay close attention to the common content on the page and make sure we get it right. Because if we make, it, if we make a mistake in our template and we haven't cloned it yet, then we just change it in one place. We add something to the header or add something to the footer. After we've gone through the process of cloning and making our individual pages copying from the template, then we have to repeat that change several times. That's the bad news, if you will. All right? The good news is 
As far as CSS goes, we don't really have that problem, right? Because we are going to put our CSS in an external file. And all of our pages are going to share that one external CSS file. So if we decide that we don't like the color the page is, we want it to be, you know, blue instead of green, for example. If we've put the code in an external CSS file, then the change is easy to make. We only have one place to make that change. So in developing your prototype, you want to make sure that you get the common areas of the HTML as, as good and as complete as you possibly can. And um, the CSS, though, you have the ability to only change it in one place anyhow. So if you don't get that exactly perfect, that's less of a big deal. All right? So that's the approach we're going to take. We're going to make a template. All right? And the template is going to have the common code in HTML. And it's going to have sort of a placeholder for the code that is specific to each page. We're going to make a CSS file for that template to implement the look that we want for our site. And then when we're done, we're going to clone that several times. And we're going to go in and fill in the specific content on every page. All right. So that's sort of the step we're going to process. Create an HTML template, create an external CSS file, Make sure our HTML template, the common code, is as complete as we possibly can. So really think about it. Maybe show it to someone if you're working as part of a team, all right, to make sure you haven't forgotten anything. Once you are reasonably sure that you have your template HTML-wise as complete as possible, develop a CSS page for it. Actually, you could do those two at the same time, develop the CSS as you're doing the HTML. But show someone your template. Once that is fixed and that looks as good as it possibly can, then you clone it. And the good news is CSS changes are easy to make. HTML changes after you've cloned them are a little hard because you have to duplicate, duplicate uh, the changes to the common code. So that's the step, the, the, the process that we're going to go through. Um, we're going to continue the example. We're going to say that we have to do a site for uh, a band, the Mike Zeller's band. And we're going to have a home page, a music page, a schedule page, and a contact us page. So just a small site, all right? And our wireframe is going to look like this, where we have a header, a nav, the content area, which is going to be different for each one of these, and then finally a footer. These three areas being common on every page. And the content area being different on every page. So let's go and let's make, um, let's start working on our template. Some of these things should be pretty easy to figure out what we're going to do, right? In other words, what is the header going to be? The header is going to be a header tag, all right? What is the nav going to be? It's going to be a nav tag. What is the content going to be? Well, we could make it a section, we could make it an article, really doesn't matter. All right, and finally the footer is going to be a footer tag. So we're going to have those four basic tags. All right. The important part of this, of this upcoming segment, several lectures, is going to be the CSS. We're not going to really learn any new HTML for a, a few classes. All right, the big thing is going to be styling because we saw in the CSS Zen uh, Garden example that you can do so much with CSS, and we have really just scratched the surface. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about CSS to get the different kinds of layouts that we want, and talk about CSS that will work both on a mobile device and on a desktop device, and so on. 
All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to start making my page. One thing I would suggest is as you are developing your prototype to test it on different browsers as you are building it. Don't wait until the very end and then try it on other browsers. If you code in a standard way, you minimize your chance for browser compatibility issues. But you don't completely eliminate them. And therefore, really the only way to know for sure if your page works across multiple browsers is to test it across multiple browsers. And really it even gets worse than that because it actually depends on the version of the browser that you're using. Uh, so for example, something that works in one version of Internet Explorer might not work in another. All right? um, so it's important to, to test it. And therefore I would suggest test. Don't wait until you're done and then do your cross-browser testing because then you're liable to discover a whole bunch of problems. And it's easier to find problems when there's a little bit of code than to find problems when there's a lot of code. So therefore, do the testing as you are developing your page. All right, so I'm going to put a title tag in here. Now keep in mind as I'm doing this, that you can use any of the HTML that we've learned so far in this class. Um, I'm going to keep things pretty simple because really the focus of these lectures isn't on the HTML but it's going to be on the CSS. So I'm going to devote more time to creating the CSS than in creating the HTML. But for example, the header, you could put a logo in there. So you could put an image in there if you wanted to. I'm not going to do that, but if you're thinking in terms of your project, you could put uh, an image as part of your header section. What's going to be in, in the header section? Well, again, something that makes it very clear what your site is about. You don't want people looking at your site and guessing about what your site is about. So you're going to have probably an H1 tag, and you might have some um, little description underneath it. So I'm going to say Northeast Ohio's premier classic rock band. I'm then going to put my nav section. And we talked about this before. What is a nav section? A nav section is really an unordered list of links. All right? So I'm going to do that. Now, if you're thinking ahead, you might say, well, an unordered list is going to put bullet points stacked vertically. And in my wireframe, my navigation is going horizontally. All right. Don't worry about that. That's what we have CSS for. You use the tags that are the correct tags to describe the content. You use CSS to make them look the way that you want them to. Um, I gave feedback on some of the earlier assignments where people used, for example, like H5 tags because they wanted the, the text to be smaller. Well, that was okay with what you knew at that point in time. But going forward, as we get into CSS, if you want, if something is a top level heading, you make it an H1. If you don't like the size of it, you change that via CSS. You don't make it something other than an H1. And again, what do the H's represent? They represent sort of a level of a heading, like in an outline. 
So I'm going to make an unordered list. And I'm going to put I'm going to put my series of links in here. It's a good idea if you make your page be index.html because that's a default on many web servers for your home page. If you ever notice like when you go to name a site, Google or Yahoo or ESPN, you don't type in the name of a web page, you just type in a domain name. Yet it comes up with a web page. Well, web servers know that if you type in a URL and don't supply a page name, there's a certain default page that the web server is configured to go to. And usually that's going to be index.html. Or in many cases, it will be index.html. So that's sort of a good habit to get into. So I'm going to make my home page index.html. I'm going to make my other pages, um, what did I say, music. Get Joel. And contact. All right, so that's my nav section. I then have my content section. And this section is going to be the section that is different on every single page. So I definitely just need something to fill in the place. And, uh, and, and definitely in the template, it would be OK to use Greek text. It is even OK, I suppose, to carry that Greek text through the rest of your prototype. However, the better that you can make your sample content look, the, the, the better the prototype is going to be. You sort of have to balance a prototype. You want it, you want it, to, you want it to look somewhat complete, but it doesn't have to be perfect. All right. So I'm going to go and generate some Greek text here. And I'm going to put it in my template. Generate, I'll generate two paragraphs. I'm going to wrap these guys in paragraph tags. And then finally, I'm going to put a footer tag that contains the footer information. Okay. So this is going to be just the plain old HTML, and it's going to look like 
the kinds of pages that we developed the first week of class. So we're going to save it. Save it as an HTML file. I'm going to call it template.html. And I can open it up. And there's our page looking like a page that we would have done the first week of class. All right? Now, um, next thing I want to do is I want to add a style sheet. Now, I'm going to show you how I um, would, would develop this. All right? Uh, again, um, I, and, and, this isn't a case of where I teach one thing and then do something else if I'm actually doing a web page. This is the exact same process I would do if I was creating a web page. Next thing I'm going to do after I have the HTML, I'm going to create a style sheet file. All right? And I'm going to put that, I'm going to associate the style sheet file with my web page. And I'm going to just do a small change just to make sure that I've hooked up the style sheet file with my web page. All right. One thing that a lot of students do is they try to take on too much in one shot. All right. And that's okay if stuff works. But if stuff doesn't work, then you're, you have a hard time troubleshooting it. So if I'm going to create an external style sheet and associate it with my web page, I first want to make sure that I've connected the two correctly. Right? Because if I haven't connected my style sheet correctly to my web page, then it doesn't matter what I put in my style sheet, it's not going to work. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to just create a very simple style sheet file, and I am going to um, um, connect it to my, my template and make sure that the style sheet file works. Then I can go ahead and do more stuff in my style sheet file. All right. So I'm going to go in Notepad and I'm going to create a new style sheet file. And I'm just going to do something real simple, like I'm going to make the body um, be a shade of gray. All right. How do I know that's a shade of gray? Because all the values are the same. Or, another way to say it, these three pairs are the same. All right? This matches this matches this, which means that there's equal amounts of red, green, and blue, and that is going to be somewhere on the continuum of white to black. All right? This is actually going to be a lighter shade of gray because these are higher values. All right? And remember, I can specify it that way, or I can specify RGB, and then put in a value from um, 0 to 255. So I could do 200, 200, 200. And then I'm going to make the text color be a darker shade of gray. I think this is a nice technique to do. If you want it to be essentially white and black, but you want a little bit of difference in it, if you, if you use like different shades of gray. Gray somehow seems appropriate for a classic rock band, so we'll go with that. All right, so I go in and I put this in my style sheet file, and I'll save it. as a CSS file. And I'll give it a name of main, because it's going to be my main CSS file. 
Keep in mind, it's possible to have more than one CSS file. There's a number of reasons that you could do that. You can have a CSS file that is, uh, applies whether, well, when the site is being viewed on a desktop computer, and you could have a different CSS file that applies if it's being viewed on a mobile device. And we'll learn that technique. You could have a, still a different CSS file if you're printing the stuff on a printer. So for example, if you had a colorful page that maybe had a background image or something like that, maybe your print version of the page when you go to print it out, maybe you just want it to be plain black and white, right? So it can print out and in, in it's easier to read on paper. So you might have a different style sheet um, if it's being printed out versus if it's being displayed on the screen. In addition, you could have most of your site you want to look a certain way and a certain portion of the site you want to have a slightly different style. Now you don't want to change it up too much, right? Because otherwise it won't be consistent. But remember, consistent doesn't mean that every page is going to be exactly identical. So you can change things up a little bit. All right? So um, for all those reasons, you could have more than one style sheet. And in this case, this is my main style sheet, so we'll go with that. Now, before I go any further, I'm going to go and apply this style sheet to my template. And I'm going to make sure that that works. Because if that works, if, if that doesn't work, rather, um, there's no sense even going on, right? Because I'll be making changes to the CSS file and I won't be able to see them. So I'm doing something very simple to start. I'm going to test it. And then I'm going to go and do more. Then I'm going to do more extensive stuff in the CSS file. All right, so I go make sure everything's saved. Then I click refresh, and there's our page. All right, still not necessarily an award-winning design, but notice how just a, a small change like that makes it um, look at least a little more polished. All right. Okay. The next thing we're going to learn is what is called the CSS box model. All right. Um, every block tag on our page you can think of as being a box. So if we look at our HTML header, that's a big box, right? That's this stuff over here. Our nav section. It's a big box. Our section is a big box. And finally, our footer is a big box. What the CSS box model says is this, that they're big boxes, and you can apply certain attributes to them. Let's look at the attributes that you can apply, or some of the attributes that you can apply in the CSS box model. Let's look, for example, at our header section. And our header section looks like this. We have an H1. We have a paragraph. And then we have an end header. Actually, we have three boxes here, right? We have a box for our header. We have a box for the H1, and we have a box for the paragraph. So if I was going to sketch this out, the boxes look like this. I'll give a little bit of space just to show. So the header is this big box. The H1 is this box, and the paragraph is this box. Okay. Now, remember that there are certain defaults that the browser applies if you don't have CSS to contradict them. So one of the defaults is that a box goes all the way across the screen. A box fills the width of the screen. 
a box is as tall as it needs to be to fit the content in. All right? Now, we can set several attributes to that box, to any of our boxes. We can set a margin. And we can set the margin in all four directions. We can have a right margin, a left margin, a top margin, and a bottom margin. We can set them all at one time and just say the margin is such and such, or we can set them individually and say margin dash top is such and such. We then have a border, which is just as it implies, it's like a bot, you know, actually drawing the box. And again, we have a border in all four directions. We can have, we have a border top, a border bottom, a border right, and a border left. All right? And you, know, you can set them individually or you can set them all at once. All of these box model properties you can either set individually or you can set one at a time. All right. Lastly, you have padding. And padding is the space from the border to where the content starts. All right. So let's play around with these. And let's look at some of the different ways that you can set those. And I'm going to set some of them individually and some of them I'm going to set collectively. But let's play around with the, the, the box of our header. All right. So I'm going to put my CSS file. Oh, I forgot two important things. You can specify a width, and you can specify a height. When you specify a width, you're specifying the width of just the content, not the content plus the margin and border and all that. The margin and the border and the padding get added on to the width to make the total size of the thing. So if I were to make if I were to make the uh, width 200 pixels and I had 10 padding and zero margin and zero border, it would actually be 220 wide, right? Because there'd be 10 padding on the one side, there'd be the 200 pixels for the width, then there'd be 10 padding on the other side. Now you can specify things either in pixels or percentages, all right? CSS is one of those things where the concepts are real simple, but the, 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 as they say, the devil's in the details, right? There's so many different variations and different um, options that you have that that's what makes it complex. And you want to work on getting, you know, an optimal mix of these things. There's also a minimum width that you can supply and a minimum height. All right. So you, for example, you can make it a certain percentage of the screen, but make it no smaller than 400 pixels. So we'll play around with all of these things over the next while. Really understanding the box model is critical uh, in going forward and understanding the rest of this. So, header. I'm going to put a border around it. Okay. Two pixels, black, solid. All right. Border is one of those attributes where I could set things individually or I could set them together. So, the other way to do this would be to say, Border width, 
two pixels, border color, black, border style, solid. This is the equivalent of doing this. The browser doesn't get confused because it knows 2px has to be the width of the border, right? 2px doesn't make sense for the color. Likewise, solid has to be the style of the border because style, uh, solid doesn't make sense for the width or for the color. I can even take it further if I want to, and I could say border top width, border top color, border top style, like this. And then I could do the same thing for border left, border right, border bottom. All right? So we'll play with this a little bit. Um, and, and, and we'll see what some of the things we can do. We'll just look at this, though. This is usually how I do my borders. Is Generally speaking, I want my borders to be the same all the way around. So I don't specify right, top, and left. And just to be concise, I usually put the borders in this way. So if I do this and hit refresh, there's a two pixel border going all the way around it. So I can make it bigger if I want to. So I can make a 10 pixel border if I wanted to. All right. And there we go. Now notice how this, the content is right alongside of it. All right, is right up against the border. That is the padding attribute. So I could say padding 10 pixels. And again, I could specify padding 10 pixels or I could say padding top 10 pixels, padding right 10 pixels, padding left 10 pixels, and so on. So I could specify them individually if I wanted to adjust and make one of them different than the other. If I only put one padding, it uses it in all four directions. Top, and it goes like a clock. Top, right, bottom, and left. If I actually did two values here, It would do 10 on the top, 20 on the right, 10 on the bottom, 20 on the left. All right? So you have a lot of flexibility on how you express those. So if I go and save this now and look, notice how there is space between there. So it's a good idea to look to, to put padding on your pages. All right? That's something that really makes it um, look, um, look a lot better. In, in my opinion, all right? Uh, and, and that's something that a lot of people seem to forget. Um, obviously, in this class, we haven't talked about it yet, so I'm not saying in this class, but in, in classes I've had in the past, is they've forgotten to put the padding in. And when it sort of runs all together with the border, um, it sort of, uh, I don't know, it doesn't look quite as good, uh, if you ask me. All right, um, I could give a different color here if I wanted to, RGB let's make it 128, 128, 128 makes the border a little less prominent. Now, I could make the width either with pixels or with percentages. So I could say the width is 400 pixels. And that'll make it that big. And it doesn't matter how big the screen is, it stays that big. For the most part, though, um, it's usually better to put percentages in. 
And again, that relates to the different size screens that people are liable to be viewing your page in. Uh, a mobile device versus a desktop device and so on. So I could say, make the width of this 50%. And it makes it that big. And as I resize the page, it gets bigger or smaller. Now, there might be a size that I don't want it to get any smaller than, even on a small screen. So I could put a minimum width in there and say maybe I don't want to get it smaller than 350 pixels. So even on a flip phone, it wouldn't get smaller than that. So notice it resizes to a point, and boom, there you go. Now notice it did some things by default, right? Just because of the way my HTML is set up. My HTML is set up such that the H1 is contained in the header. Now H1s take up the full width. And I lied a little bit when I said that H1s take up the full width of the screen. It was a little lie, so, so don't, don't yell at me. All right? What's inaccurate about that is H1s take the, and block, all block tags, not just H1s, take up the size of the container. <clears throat> now, what is the container? It's whatever tag it's contained in. So, for example, this header is contained in the body tag. The body is, of course, the whole width of the screen, the whole width of the browser window. So if I say that this has 50% width, that's 50% of the screen's width. If I were to put in a H1 rule, let's do H1 and do a background color of And look at that. Notice the H1 takes up not the entire screen, but takes up the tag in which it's contained. All right. So in other words, if this H1 is part of the header, by default, that H1 is going to stay inside of the header. It doesn't go all the way across the screen. Does that make sense? So if I were to say with 50%, that will not be 50% of the entire screen. That would be 50% of its container. Its container is the header section, which has a width of 50%. So this would be 50% of 50%. Or 25%. Now notice the browser is a nice, uh, has some nice features in it. And at first it might seem a little confusing or, or uh, irritating, but it's actually a good thing. And the, um, the good thing is, is that um, it's not going to cut off the content. It's going to, unless you specify style rules to do this, if there's not enough room to put the content, it will drop it down to the next line with a block tag. And again, we've noticed that right from the start with paragraphs. Notice the paragraphs, as the browser window resizes, the paragraphs reposition themselves so it all fits on the page. Likewise with this. All right? This is going to, um, if, the, if the header isn't big enough to fit all the words across, it's going to drop it down to the next line. All right, the last thing we have not talked about um, is, is, is margins, all right?
So, I'm going to do margin, and I could specify margin bottom, margin left, margin right, margin top, or I can specify all four margins this way. 20 pixels, auto. All right. What does that mean? What does it mean that I have two values there? Well, it assigns them like a clock, like I said before. So if I do this, and I specify that this has a margin of 20 pixels auto, it's going to make the top margin 20 pixels, it's going to make the right margin auto, so it's going around in a clock, top, right, bottom, and left. What does auto mean? Auto will automatically adjust the margin to center it. All right? So if I put that in here for this, that will center that. And notice it's 20 from the top. And notice that the next thing, there's 20, there's, there's 20 um, pixels between the nav and this. Think of the margin as being the space between your elements. So if I make this 100, or if I make this 200, let's say, there's 200 pixels from the top down to there, and there's 200 pixels from there. This margin is automatic. So as I resize it, notice that the margins change on the right and left, but the margin on the top stays constant because I put that as 200 pixels. So maybe a more realistic one would be something like that. All right. I want to finish up one thing today. And we'll pick this up next time. If you looked at our wireframe from what we had before, we wanted these links to be oriented horizontally. And yet, currently, they're oriented vertically. Well, you might say, well, then don't put them in a list tag. No, that's not correct. This is a list of items. So we want this to be in a list tag. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this for the nav, and we can play with this some more next week, but I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to say list style type of none. That's going to get rid of the bullet point. Finally, I'm going to say nav li display inline. That's going to change my li tags from being block tags, which are stacked vertically, to be inline tags, which are stacked side by side. Now notice I have a slightly different selector. I have nav ul, nav li. What that will do is that won't do it for every ul or every li, but it will do it for the uls and li's that are included in the nav section. So I can be more precise with my selector. I don't just have to say every li looks this way or every ul looks this way. I can say just the lists in my navigation section. So if I do this then, I have my navigation oriented horizontally, which is the way that I want it to. Now, one of the things we're going to play around with next time is to make these look more like links, to make these look sort of like buttons. So it's very obvious that these are the links on my page. I mean, it's sort of obvious the way it is now, but it looks kind of plain. We could probably do a better job of really making that navigation stand out. All right. 
We're going to continue sort of on these lines for the next few classes and really focus on the styling to get the page to be laid out and to look the way that we want it to. Are there any questions? Yes. You mean separate style files? Yeah. You, you could, but there really isn't. The only benefit for that would be if, if you, the question was, is could you have multiple style sheets and put the body style in one, in one style sheet and put the H1 style in another style sheet? You could, but that would be very difficult to sort of maintain. In other words, if you're looking for a certain piece of style code, you might have to look between several files. Now, there's reasons to have multiple style sheet files, but I wouldn't think that that would be a good reason for doing that. What, 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 were, you, what were you thinking as far as doing it that way? What advantage did you see? Okay, now that might be an okay thing. In other words, if you had something specific to a certain piece of functionality, um, you could put that in a separate, uh, a, a separate file. So if you had CSS, for example, to achieve a, a drop-down menu, yeah, that would, that, would be, that would be possibly a good reason to do it. So the bottom line is you can, but you'd sort of want to do it carefully and make sure you have a good purpose for doing it. Right, don't, doesn't mean you should, exactly. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.